said, I'm here to just give a little bit of background and context about the Wisconsin economy in general uh, at, to inform the conversation about agriculture and dairy more specifically. So first I'm showing a GDP growth index for the United States in the dotted line and then Wisconsin in the solid black line using 2012 as my base level. And you can see that the economy is growing in Wisconsin just as it, is, as it is for the United States, just not quite as robustly coming out of the recession. So the recession is still you know, visible there with the dip in 2009, but we have had pretty consistent growth. For comparison, uh, I wanted us to think about what's going on in the rest of the country. And in general, uh, the strongest growth is in our western states. The strongest growth is in California, Oregon, Wisconsin. And in general, Wisconsin's on, on track with the rest of the Midwest region, however. I also wanted to look within the state. While it's true that Wisconsin's been growing, it's not true that it's been growing equally everywhere within the state. So this is new data, just came out a few months ago from the census, it's preliminary, but I wanted to share it with you because it shows the variation in growth from 2013 to 2015 at the county level. So this is new data, like I said, kind of GDP at the county level, we could call it GCP. And what you see is that some of the state actually hasn't had quite such a positive experience even though we're growing in general. In particular, for example, Kiwani County is the, the dark gray, the darkest gray. They had a nuclear power plant close in 2013. And you see the way that that affected their growth over this, this particular period that I'm showing you. So again, keeping in mind um, that things aren't equally good everywhere. This is thinking about where GDP is headed over the, the coming years through 2019 and 2020. I pulled the... Wall Street Journal survey of economists. So they survey about 70 economists and they ask them to project, you know, what's gonna be happening with the economy over the next two years. And what they said on average is that they expect growth to stay at about 2% through 2019 and eventually decline to just below 2%, 1.7% or so into 2020. The Congressional Budget Office released a report yesterday. They were relatively consistent with what we're seeing here, projecting about 2.2% growth, 2.3% growth into next year, and then again kind of dropping into 2020, ending at around 1.7%. The CDO report also talked a little bit about the impact of the government shutdown and how we might expect that to affect growth. Uh, depending on how you keep track, they expect that the level of GDP will be down about a tenth of a percentage point for quarter four of 2018 and two tenths of a percentage point for quarter one of 2019. I was noticing when I was reading the news that I was seeing estimates that were a little higher than that, upwards of um, 0.4, for example, and it's just a matter of whether we're looking at uh, the level of GDP or the annualized growth rate. So, uh, but most of that, the good news is, should be recouped in the coming quarters. So we should see, for example, relatively high growth in quarter two of 2019. So the Wall Street Journal also asked, what's the probability of a recession? So you see the kind of wide variation in opinions on this. When's the next recession gonna be? Is it, how likely is it for this year? Last year, on average, the economist said about 13.1% probability uh, of a recession in 2018. And you see that that's creeped up here for 2019. On average, about 25% chance of a recession. Uh, Mark Zandi is an economist for Moody Analytics. I see him quoted in the news a lot. And he basically said, well, if not this year, probably next year. And that's a sentiment that I keep seeing show up. So I expect if I'm back up here next year, we'll see that line move again with an even higher probability of a recession. So turning now to employment, similar to before, I have the employment growth index using the trough of the recession 2009 as my base year. And you see again, pretty consistent growth for both Wisconsin and the United States, uh, just not quite as robust here in Wisconsin as it has been for the US more generally. We've kind of already touched on a labor shortage and I can't help but wonder, and I've had this discussion with my colleagues, you know, what's going on here? Could it be the case that with a different labor situation, might we see higher employment growth, for example. 
So it could be possible that we have a slight constraint on growth because of our, our labor situation. So here we have the unemployment rate for the U.S., the Midwest, and Wisconsin. And again, kind of speaking to how tight the labor market is right now, we see that Wisconsin's below the U.S. as well as low for the region. Uh, BLS, if I'm remembering right, said we have the 11th lowest unemployment rate in the country right now. Um, just Minnesota and Iowa, for example, in our region are, are below us. So really low unemployment. Uh, I think it was the lowest in June at 2.9% of this year, excuse me, July, um, and has been head steady at 3% ever since. Again, I wanted to highlight the regional variation that we're seeing in the state. Just because things are, you know, just because unemployment is low doesn't mean it's equally low everywhere. And you see that in northern Wisconsin, for example, uh, this is preliminary data for November 2018, so it could be revised. But I expect we'll maintain this kind of regional variation where it's things in the north, you know, unemployment just hasn't come down as much as it has here in the rest of the state. We also see that southeast Wisconsin, relatively high unemployment compared to the rest of the state, but maxing out at 4.8%. So I wanted to comment a little bit more on the potential for a labor shortage. And these data aren't available for Wisconsin specifically. So what I'm showing you is for the Midwest region. And what I've done is taken the unemployment data. So how many unemployed people do we have? How many people do we have that would like to have a job but do not? And taken that as a ratio against how many job openings do we have? So is it in fact the case that we have more job openings than we do people willing to fill those openings? So what this shows is that during the recession 2009 or so, we had upwards of eight people looking for a job for every opening we had. This ratio bottomed out in August of 2018 at 0.74. So based on this figure for the Midwest, we did have more uh, openings than we did workers looking for those positions. And the tables have really turned. In 2009, we had a large labor pool. We had workers that were having to compete against each other for positions. Now it's really changed where our employers are competing against each other for workers. So it's a very different labor market today, of course, um, than several years ago. If, if employers are competing for workers, one place we might expect that to show up is in wages. We would expect to see some wage growth. Uh, what I'm showing you for 2018 is just based on quarter one and quarter two. The, the others aren't released yet, and these could still be revised. But it's still the case when we're looking at wage growth, it is up. But it's not up higher than anything we saw before the recession. So I'm curious what's going on there, and I think there are several scenarios that could explain this. That even if we do have a labor shortage, it could be the case that our employers are using other forms of compensation that it's showing up in benefits, that they're competing for workers in that way. Gym memberships, healthcare benefits, for example, flexibility, childcare, maybe that's the way that workers are competing, or excuse me, that employers are competing for workers now. It could be the case that because we have commodity and commodity-like industries, that there's really only so high wages can go in order to maintain margins. So this could be a constraint based on our industries, to some extent. And this could be just very simply that the data is not there yet. It could be that once we have quarter three and quarter four come out, that if these are revised, that they'll actually see them come up and we'll have you know, an additional data point in terms of um, are we dealing with the labor shortage. Another place we might look if we're trying to think about do we have a labor shortage is average weekly hours worked. So if it's the case that employers can't find more workers, we might think that they would ask the workers they do have to work more hours. And average weekly hours work I'm showing for private employees and then manufacturing specifically. Those average weekly hours have come up, but they actually peaked in 2015. So we're several years now from our highest levels in terms of average weekly hours worked. So again, I think it's useful to think about what might be going on here. Is it the case that we're switching towards automation? That employers are feeling enough pressure now that we're using other uh, methods of production and that's why it's not showing up here. So some more context and some more things to think about when we're trying to understand uh, a labor shortage. 
In general, I wanted to give you the unemployment projections, uh, very similar to the GDP project projections. These are coming from the Wall Street Journal. And they show uh, unemployment continuing to decline into 2019, but eventually coming back up close to 4.2% uh, in 2020, which I think makes sense alongside these figures that we expect the economy to slow down a little bit in 2020 as well. I want to highlight a different form of employment. This is non -farm, um, a non-farm proprietor growth index. So this is a way of thinking about who's self-employed in the economy. So not just wage and salary workers, but who's creating a job for themselves. We have this growing, people, a growing pool of people who are, in fact, creating a job for themselves, even though they don't have hired employees. And we see that proprietorship is growing, both in the U.S. and Wisconsin. Again, not quite as robustly in Wisconsin. Several reasons for that. We can think of this capturing some um, measure of entrepreneurial propensity in Wisconsin. Across several metrics, Wisconsin just tends to be not quite as entrepreneurial. That could speak to our industrial composition. Being far from the coast, we don't have quite as diverse a population, so these minority populations that tend to be very entrepreneurial just don't have as large a presence in Wisconsin, for example. So it could be part of what explains just a not quite as robust growth rate when it comes to proprietorship. Another way of thinking about entrepreneurial activity in the Wisconsin economy is to look at establishment births. So proprietorship gives us a sense of who is self-employed, uh, what is our stock of self-employed people. Establishment births is looking at how is entrepreneurial activity fluctuating from year to year. So establishment births both kind of signal this idea of self-employment and who's creating jobs, at least for themselves, but it's also capturing slightly larger ventures, who's creating jobs for others by opening a relatively larger venture. And we see, again, establishment births coming up. So for Wisconsin, the black line and the corresponding um, axis here, and then for the United States, the red dotted line, and then on the red axis. And we see both coming up in Wisconsin and the United States. So good for entrepreneurial activity, good for self-employment, good for job creation more generally as well. Just two uh, more metrics that I want to touch on. One is inflation. So again, coming from this Wall Street Journal survey of economists, um, expecting inflation to basically hold steady at the targeted 2% over the next uh, two years. And then last is interest rates. So here I'm showing you the federal funds rate where we've been in 2018 and then what people expect and to see interest rates coming up through uh, 2020 and 2021. So this is the federal funds rate specifically. This is um, the banks have to have a certain amount of cash on hand at the end of each day. Uh, some banks tend to have a little bit more. Some banks tend to be a little bit under. So they loan to each other. And the federal funds rate sets the rate at which they loan to each other. And this tends to ripple through the economy. It tends to show up in our commercial and industrial interest rates as well. So as interest rates come up, we would expect to see that across the economy. With inflation holding, you might be asking, you know, why, why is the federal fund rate coming up? Typically, we would expect the federal fund rate maybe to be used to control inflation, but inflation seems relatively steady. And I expect that uh, this is partly uh, to preserve a policy tool for us. When we have a recession, we tend to lower interest rates as one of our tools for stabilizing the economy. But the re recession, interest rates got slow, so low that we kind of eliminated that tool for us ourselves. So as the interest rate comes back up, we might have a little bit of room to use interest rates should we find ourselves in another recession in the coming years. All right, thank you for your time.